I am going to be talking today about uh, program synthesis, but I want to take a step back and think more broadly about a basic kind of AI goal, which is how we can better combine learning and reasoning. Um, so there's a number of reasons why I'm out to combine them. Um, one is that reasoning gives you certain kinds of systematic generalization, whereas learning gives you uh, kind of more uh, graded forms of generalization. Uh, from reasoning, we can get things like formal guarantees. So if it's a program, we can formally verify properties of that program. Uh, but learning, particularly deep learning, has an extra kind of extreme scalability, um, at least in the modern uh, sort of learning toolkit. Um, a kind of colloquial way of thinking about these things is that reasoning is really about knowledge, both how we acquire and deploy knowledge. And learning is really about the acquisition and use of intuitions, about uh, things we can acquire from statistics. So as an example of a system um, that we built, which um, uses programs to both learn and reason, uh, we made a system which looks at hand drawings um, like this sketch right here, um, and then infers a high level program. Um, so kind of inductively reasons and says, what kind of program would um, best explain this image? Um, so using a combination of sort of symbolic reasoning techniques like sat solving, as well as neural networks, both for perception and also for guiding search, um, we can infer a program which captures kind of the high level structure of this drawing. So here, probably when you look at this drawing, you see some kind of nested structure of um, circles inside of rectangles. And you can describe that with a pair of nested loops. Um, once you have this program, um, you can do high level reasoning tasks. So for example, if you look at this image and you ask yourself, what would it mean to extrapolate this image, to extend its visual patterns? Um, so we can kind of mimic that reasoning process by extending the bounds on this loop. Um, and then when you run this program, what you get is a kind of extrapolation of visual patterns that uh, you can see from this picture. Um, and you can extend similar ideas to um, not these simple hand drawings, but to things that look more like uh, three-dimensional objects, like a furniture. So here, if there's repeated parts, you can capture that with for loops. Or if there's symmetries or reflections, you can capture that with higher order operators. So um, there's a few reasons why you might want to use programs as a way of uh, building AI systems that both learn and reason. So for one thing, uh, programs tend to generalize um, really well. Um, that's kind of what it means to be an algorithm, the fact that you have preconditions and postconditions, and as soon as you satisfy the preconditions, you automatically get the post conditions. So um, instead of just interpolating around data points, if you have an algorithm, then in theory, you can at least extrapolate outside of the immediate training data. Um, programs are also the way that humans write down formal knowledge. Um, and uh, it acts both as a way of communicating between humans and also as a way of um, uh, making that knowledge executable. So um, to see this clearly contrast a programmatic representation of a 3D object like an electric drill, here shown as a CAD program with the analogous point cloud or mesh representation. The CAD program is much easier to pull apart and understand and interpret and remix than the corresponding point cloud or mesh. But really the most celebrated feature of programs is their uh, Turing completeness. The fact that at least in principle, you can write down any computable function as some kind of program. And so if we ask ourselves, how can we learn programs? then at least in principle, um, we could cover many different kinds of machine intelligence within this framework. So there's a number of different approaches that people have taken to making systems which come up with programs. And in general, this field goes under the name of program synthesis. Um, and uh, probably the most well-known program synthesizer is a system called FlashFill, which learns programs that edit text. So given some text like this, like company code index HTML, and some target output like company code, or some string like company doc spec specs dot doc, and then the output of company doc spec, it can infer a simple program uh, involving regular expressions and string concatenation, things like that, for doing this um, uh, string transformation. Or I really like this uh, recent system called Zelensky from UW, which um, takes his input a uh, mesh representation of some shape. So it's uh, very low level and unstructured. And then it can synthesize a high level um, programmatic representation in terms of maps and folds and uh, kind of parametric modeling routines. So under the hood, 
Although these systems work in different ways, one thing that's really important is a carefully designed domain specific language. So they're not synthesizing programs in arbitrary programming languages like Python or whatever. Instead, they have some kind of grammar which provides structured prior knowledge about what kinds of programs are useful to synthesize for this domain. So for Flashfill, it knows about things like strings and regexes. For Zelensky, it knows about things like uh, vector arithmetic. So in addition to this language, uh, these systems also have some kind of um, domain-specific inference machinery, which can efficiently search through the combinatorial space of programs. And this kind of inference mach machinery typically exploits properties of the domain-specific language. So Flashville is a kind of dynamic program on strings, and Zelensky is a kind of graph rewrite system over um, uh, uh, geometric operations. So there's lots of other ways that people have tried to synthesize programs. So the genetic programming literature um, pioneered by uh, John Koza and others um, kind of tries to randomly evolve programs. So treating like syntax trees as things that we can mutate and cross over. Um, the per uh, people have also looked at training neural nets to synthesize programs. So um, some kind of neural network which looks at um, a specification of what the program should do and then outputs the source code, kind of like a uh, language model. Um, and in the programming languages community, people have looked at formal methods for doing synthesis. So for example, um, the sketch system compiles uh, program synthesis problems into a kind of constraint satisfaction language and then uh, solves it using SAT. So all these systems have been successful in uh, different ways, um, but in particular, none of them don't, or none of them really look like how people write code. So in particular, people don't enumerate all programs and exhaustively explore them and just check them to see if they work. Um, they also typically don't randomly cross over programs or mutate them. Um, they don't type out a bunch of code all at once and hope that it's gonna work, kind of like how a neural network language model would do. Um, we typically don't get formal guarantees when humans are in the loop. We're not provably obtaining the optimal program. And although learning plays an important part in how we came to be programmers, we did not learn from reading GitHub absent prior coding experience. Instead, what humans do is this laundry list of activities. They do things like, like learn from textbooks. And they don't just do the exercise in the textbook, but they make up their own programming problems. They also come up with libraries for encapsulating the kinds of routines that span multiple problems. The way they come up with these libraries is often by refactoring their code. And they don't refactor it just to be more reusable, but also to be more efficient and more interpretable. They program interactively with interpreters and debuggers and use things like profilers to understand what their code is doing in, in a way which kind of goes back and forth between program execution and program writing. So in this talk, I'm going to be um, discussing some work that um, I've done with my collaborators on um, how we can take insights um, like those in the previous slide and reinterpret them and repurpose them as um, ways of doing program synthesis. So I'll talk about um, ways of using interpreters, um, ways of building libraries, and some ongoing work on coming up with new programming problems. So, um, I'll start out with talking about work on doing interpreters, which um, I did with my advisors at the time, Josh Tannenbaum and Armando Salezama, and uh, three co-students at the time, uh, Max Nye, uh, Evan Poo, and Felix Sosa. Um, and the kind of setup that we're considering is one where we observe a um, uh, some three-dimensional um, specification of what an object should be. And we want to infer a CAD program which can render to that object. So for example, we can render it under different views um, or take apart the pieces and change how the object is structured. Or we also consider kind of flash fill type problems where we're learning programs that edit strings. So for graphics, what we do is we start with a domain specific language. So we're still in the paradigm that someone gave us this domain specific language. And we're going to start with a very simple um, DSL, a domain specific language, one where we can simply add and subtract shapes and where we have some small inventory of uh, primitive shape building operations. Here are just cuboids, spheres, and cylinders. 
So the issue is that in order to solve this synthesis problem, we have to search through the space of programs and try to find one which, if we executed it, would render to the specification. So in this case, a 3D voxel array. And if you imagine doing a kind of tree search over the space of programs, um, we, could, we quickly hit up against a branching factor of well over a million possible lines of code. So this search task seems very daunting. So just to make this clear, imagine we started our search with an empty program. We could consider new lines of code we could write, um, like different cuboids and cylinders and spheres. And then for each of them, we could consider different prolongations of these partial programs. And each of these branches is combinatorially large. And our depth might be like 10 or 20 um, such choices. So this seems like a, a very difficult combinatorial um, search problem. So could we just learn to emit the correct program conditioned on the target specification? So I'm going to argue that actually learning is not sufficient on its own, um, and that you need to bring to bear certain ideas about how humans would solve this problem. So first, let's step through why learning might not work on its own. So imagine that we just take our specification, like this voxel array, and we give it to some learned search policy over programs. So think like an RNN that's just going to spit out lines of code. So it's going to emit something like this. And maybe the RNN is uh, very good at doing its job. In fact, it has 90% success rate at picking which of the 1.3 million lines of code it could write. So, you know, a, a top one accuracy of 90% from 1.3 million different choices is very good. The issue is that we need to chain together um, some number of these commands. So that means that the odds of us succeeding in um, this task is going to decay exponentially. This is not really analogous to something like machine translation, where if we make a small mistake, um, we can still recover from it, or it might be kind of acceptable to have a mistake in our translation. Here, because this is code, we actually need to have it be exactly correct. And every line of code is kind of logically connected to prior lines of code. So we actually do get this exponential decay in success probability. So if you think about what's going wrong here, um, intuitively, it should feel like we're asking the neural net to do something that humans never have to do. In particular, humans don't write out all their code at once and hope it's going to work. And the same is true for graphic designers when they're making 3D models. So what we need is a kind of read eval print loop or an interactive uh, coding environment where we can build 3D models or write uh, new code and run it and see what it does. And this kind of feedback is going to help steer the search toward the correct solution. So we have a system called write, execute, assess. And um, uh, we think of it as kind of like a REPL style system. We assume that all our programs at every intermediate stage can be punched into a REPL and executed, or in the case of graphics, that they can be rendered. So the general architecture is to alternate between writing a new line of code, executing it in the REPL, and then assessing the REPL state to see if we made a mistake. So we're going to learn how to write code. We're not going to learn how to run code, because by assumption, the REPL does that for us. But we are going to learn how to assess the state to see if it's on the right track. And then the whole architecture kind of uh, wraps this up in a tree search. So starting with the first stage, which is just writing and executing code, what we're going to do is we're going to train a policy pi, which is going to take some uh, goal specification, um, a spec, and some REPL state, which is going to be renderings. And it's going to predict what kind of code we should write next. So if our spec is we need to write some code that draws this wrench, then we start from the empty program, here notated with the empty set. We pass it through our REPL, um, which says the empty program renders to the empty rendering. And then we pass this to our policy pi, which then predicts some new line of code. For example, draw a circle at coordinate 2, 8. This gets added to our partially constructed program. So you can think of it as this is like an MDP with a transition function uh, written t. So we're taking our current state and our action and giving a new state. 
We then render that, which actually draws the circle. And then the policy gets to condition on the rendering so far and the spec. And we repeat this process. And um, what you can see here is that we're kind of building up a syntax tree of a program at the bottom. And eventually, our REPL predicts that our program renders to the target specification. So one thing you should notice here is that um, programs have kind of two ways of viewing them. There's the syntax and there's the semantics. So ultimately, we want a syntactic object, a program. And we're using the REPL as a kind of go-between for syntax and semantics. And the policy is only ever observing stuff in the semantic space. So what's going on here is, in a sense, the semantics kind of screens off the syntax. Like condition on semantics, um, syntax doesn't matter. And we think this gives some extra robustness to the policy. So in addition to writing and running code, we also assess code to see if it's on the right track. So we formalize this by training a value network, uh, V, which looks at um, the specification and also at the current renderings and predicts the probability that we're actually going to reach our specification. So the way that this interacts with tree search is as follows. We start with some specification, like this voxelized chair, and we start with the empty program. Our policy kicks in and proposes lines of code. Uh, we just draw samples. So some of these samples do not look correct. For instance, um, this sideways cylinder is clearly attempting to be like a chair leg, but it's not um, at the right angle. So what the value network does is it downweights those branches of the search tree and promotes the branches of the search tree that look like they're on the right track. So for example, uh, the base of the chair gets promoted. And then we interleave the policy and the value network in a um, tree search, um, which allows us to sometimes make mistakes, but then by executing our code and looking at it and seeing that it's wrong, we can recover from those mistakes. And that helps fight this exponential decay that we would get in the probability of success. So in terms of how this tree search works, um, it's pretty open-ended as to what you do. Any way of slotting a policy and value network into a tree search algorithm is a valid way of approaching this problem. So one thing you can do is you can do like a beam search where the uh, negative log likelihood under the policy is kind of like your cost so far. And your heuristic cost to go is negative log of the value network. Remember, the value network is predicting a probability between 0 and 1 of success. So it has a natural interpretation as kind of heuristic cost to go. What we found worked a bit better was sequential Monte Carlo, where we stochastically propose moves under the policy and then reweigh them and resample them according to the value network. Um, intuitively, you can think of it as kind of like a stochastic beam search. It's not um, actually. Um, uh, like stochastic beam search also refers to another algorithm, uh, and that's not what SMC is. Um, but you can think of it intuitively as kind of like a more stochastic variant of beam search in this context. So we can train this on random data um, and uh, then try to kind of de render two dimensional and three dimensional scenes. Um, so, for example, this shovel uh, gets sort of de rendered into these parts. And if you ablate parts of the model, or if you slot in something like beam search, which we found to be less robust, then you get a um, much worse recovery of um, the target shape. And the same general thing is true for three-dimensional scenes. Um, what I think is more interesting is that um, if you test it on problems which are much longer than it was trained on, uh, we really need this explicit tree search in order to generalize to those settings. Um, so here, we're plotting on the x-axis uh, search time and on the y-axis um, uh, the intersection of a union with the um, target um, uh, uh, object. Um, and what you can see is that you uh, do much worse if you just have the policy, so that's an orange. And then if you add. Um, uh, the ability to uh, do some amount of search and also to um, correct your mistakes with the value network, and you can get much higher asymptotic performance. Um, in this purple line, we show what happens with no REPL, 
So that's just like an RNN that spits out entire programs wholesale. And that actually does quite well for small search budgets because we don't have to do any kind of rendering steps in the loop. So it's much faster, but much less accurate. So by comparing uh, with the x-axis being time, we can kind of control for the fact that some of these methods require more compute. So what you should take from this is that if I give you a, uh, a language and also a REPL, then you can make search more tractable by um, teaching neural nets to interact with that REPL. But this requires that we can always execute our uh, intermediate programs or render them. And also that the domain specific language is already handed to us. So now we're going to relax the requirement that we need to have that domain specific language. So the way we're going to relax that requirement is by asking ourselves, how can we make a system which solves many problems jointly and then tries to grow its language over time by building up a kind of library of reusable subroutines, which you can share across different programming tasks. So um, this is work um, that I did with a number of collaborators, including my advisors at the time, uh, Josh Tannenbaum and Armando Salaizama, um, and also a number of grad students. But the three main ones were Kathy Wong, Max Nye, and Matias Salamayer. Um, so the high level idea is we want to learn these kind of reusable subroutines. So think like you're solving a bunch of programming problems and you want to make your life easier by coming up with a library. You can think of this as like symbolic declarative knowledge. So we're learning a library of code, so symbolic stuff. Um, and what we're also going to learn is kind of the procedural knowledge needed to um, uh, guide search as the library grows and becomes more tuned to the problem domain. So that's going to be a neural net, and you can think of it as a synthesis algorithm. And we want to learn both these things. So to make this concrete, Imagine that you have a programming problem like sorting a list of numbers. So I might specify that with um, input output pairs. Like I might say that the list 9271 should be sorted into 1279. And also I might uh, give the system some uh, collection of programming primitives like map and fold and cons and car and cutter and arithmetic. And the job is to kind of bridge the divide between the initial primitives and the programming task on the right. So these initial primitives are very flexible, but they're not really tuned to solving a sort problem. So the system is solving a bunch of problems in parallel, um, and it can solve some of the easier ones using just the initial primitives. So one of the first things it does is it takes some of its solutions, the easier problems, and abstracts out a new um, reusable code concept. So this happened to be the fourth library routine to add it. So we call it concept four. Um, concept four corresponds to the higher order function filter, which takes a list and a predicate and removes the elements or filters the elements, which do not satisfy that predicate. So concept four is very useful, but it's not really that specific to sorting. So at this stage, we cannot solve sort. Later on, the system builds on top of concept four to come up with a library routine that calculates the maximum of a list. So this seems much more useful for sorting. And if you look deeper into its learned library, you can see that it builds on top of concept 13 and concept four to come up with a subroutine that computes the nth largest element of a list. So this is very close to sorting. And once we have this in hand, we can write a very compact piece of code, which just says um, repeatedly call concept 15 in order to get um, uh, element one, two, three, and so on of the target sorted list. So the code that it wrote is very compact and it's very easy to look at it. And as long as you understand what concept 15 does, you can um, uh, understand what this program is doing. So it's very interpretable. Um, it's also very easy for search to find. So the code is very short. So we need to search for just a few minutes before we figure out how to uh, solve the sort task. But in principle, you don't need this learned library. 
you could have just solved sort using the initial primitives. So if you were trying to do that, here's what that would look like. So this sorting algorithm is the same as the one the system found, but just um, with its learn libraries functions inlined. So this program here is long and cryptic and on the surface does not have anything to do with sorting. Um, it's not just uninterpretable, but in a sense is also inaccessible. In particular, it would take far longer than the age of the universe to discover this long unwieldy program. Um, whereas once we have this learned library, it's much easier to do search and discover how to solve the sorting task. So now I'm going to describe the algorithm which came up with this library and wrote this uh, sorting algorithm. So the algorithm is called uh, Dream Coder. It has that name because it is an instance of a wake sleep um, architecture, uh, kind of based on like the Helmholtz machine. Um, so it has a wake phase where it does program synthesis and a sleep phase um, where it goes through a stage called abstraction sleep, where it improves its library. So, so learning new code abstractions, as well as a phase called dream sleep, where it trains a neural network called a recognition model, which helps guide search during waking. So we're gonna have um, kind of a waking phase where we search for code, an abstraction sleep phase where we come up with subroutines and a dream sleep phase where we train a neural network. So from a Bayesian point of view, what's going on is there's some unknown library. From that library, we can write programs. We don't get to see those programs, but we do get to see certain tasks that those programs solve. One twist we're adding is that there's a neural network, the recognition model, which looks at a task and predicts what kind of program is likely to solve it. So if you look at this diagram here, there's really three things we don't know. We don't know the library, we don't know the programs, and we don't know the neural network weights. So that motivates a kind of three-stage inference procedure where we iteratively solve for one of those variables holding the other two fixed. So for example, during waking, what we do is we solve for the programs given the neural net and given the library. So we take some task and we show it to the, ne to the neural network, the recognition model, and that biases a search over compositions of functions um, built from the library. And we search until we either solve the task or reach a timeout. During the dreaming phase of sleep, um, we train the neural network. So the neural network um, predicts um, uh, programs conditioned on tasks. So we have to train it on program task pairs. But remember that the programs are latent variables. We don't actually get to see them. So we need some way of generating programs to supervise the network. So one thing we could do is we could simply um, replay programs that we found during waking. So we could say we've solved this task with this program. Therefore, when you see that task, predict that program. But a more interesting source of training data inspired by the Helmholtz machine is to um, uh, create so-called fantasy data or randomly generated data from our generative model. So the generative model is this library. And when we sample um, random programs, we can get an unlimited source of training data. This training data is only going to um, be high quality if the library has tuned itself to the domain. So if we've already learned subroutines, which make it so that random programs look realistic, then this fantasy data will be high quality. So we need to learn those subroutines. So that happens during the abstraction phase of sleep. And the idea is we take programs that we found during waking, um, we look at their syntax trees, and then we try to find some kind of um, common abstractions across those syntax trees, here shown in orange. And then um, the kind of Bayesian way of seeing this is that we're trying to find the most compressive new abstractions in these syntax trees. And then we add those to the library until we stop being able to compress our data. So this is the high level idea behind um, the dream coder architecture. We're learning this library, we're training a neural net, both on replays, but also on 
randomly generated programs from the growing library. And we're deploying both the library and the neural network in order to efficiently um, scale the search for programs. So we've applied this um, system to a number of domains. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of them now. Um, so the first I'm going to talk about is this um, logo graphics domain in the upper right-hand corner. Um, so for logo graphics, what we did is um, we took a corpus of um, hand-drawn, or uh, uh, not hand-drawn, um, uh, uh, logo graphics programs that make these kind of geometric designs. And for every single geometric design, the system has to write a program in logo turtle graphics. So it moves a pen over a simulated canvas and it has to exactly draw this target image. So when you run this algorithm on these tasks, um, this is what happens at the end state of learning. So on the left, I'm showing initial primitives given to the system. In the middle, I'm diagramming the learned library as a network. And on the right, I'm showing some example image tasks. And below each, the program it wrote to solve them. So if you look, for example, at this kind of swirly beach ball task, it solved it by calling out to learn function eight and learn function four. Function four is a parametric routine for drawing spirals. And this makes sense because if you look at this image, you should see that it kind of looks like a spiral that's been rotated a bunch of times. Now, if you look at function eight, um, which I think is a more interesting one, um, it's a routine for repeatedly drawing and rotating the same segment. So function eight really corresponds to the concept of radial symmetry. So it's a higher order function that it learned, which takes a count n and a body, which is another subroutine, and repeatedly draws that body while it's rotating. If you look at other routines in its learned library, you see things like um, circles and polygons, um, but also things that are less interpretable, but nonetheless useful for this domain, like this kind of parametric arc drawing routine. So this library encodes its symbolic knowledge about the domain, but it's also learning a neural net, which encodes statistical knowledge. And that neural net is trained on randomly generated programs, these fantasies or these dreams. And it's useful to look at what those dreams look like both before and after learning. So before learning, its random programs are built from the initial primitives. It has no learn library. So those initial dreams um, look like this. So here I've color coded them to show how it drew each of these um, uh, figures. So starting in light pink and ending in dark purple, um, and uh, as you can see, some of these are kind of interesting looking, but most of them are relatively unstructured. And if you draw random programs, most of them are either just blank canvases or a single line segment. So I selected these from 150 random draws to highlight the kind of complexity you can get without any learning. Um, so in reality, most of these are just blank canvases or single line segments. So now we should look at the dreams after learning. So after learning, what you see is a kind of recombination of latent um, motifs and themes that it acquired from the training data. So you can see things like um, composing this concept of radial symmetry or polygons or circles, and then combining them in new ways. So for fair comparison with the previous slide, these are the most interesting samples from 150 draws which is why they seem more complicated than the training data. But you should ask yourself, if you're training a neural net to um, make image drawing programs, do you want to train on this corpus or this corpus? So after you learn the library, uh, your neural net gets much better training data. So we also applied DreamCutter to a um, very similar domain. Uh, this is more of a planning domain instead of a drawing domain. So here it sees um, an assembly of toy blocks. And instead of moving a pen over a canvas to draw a picture, it moves a hand through a kind of Tetris-like world and it has to drop blocks in order to build these constructions. And if you look at its learned library, what you see are kind of like um, options or like planning macros for uh, making these constructions. We can again look at dreams before learning. 
and we can look at dreams after learning. And again, what you see is that there's a kind of bootstrapping action where as soon as it's learned the library, the neural network starts to get much better training data. So if you look at the dynamics of the learning over time, you can again see some hint of this bootstrapping. So initially it can solve very few problems, uh, just the easiest ones, but then it learns from those problems and then uh, gets a better library and gets a better neural network. If you ablate either of the um, sleep phases, you still get the same bootstrapping action because it's doing a kind of self-supervised learning, um, but you get much lower asymptotic performance. And I think that part of the reason why that happens is um, not just because each of these components are useful on their own, but because there's an interaction between them. As you get a better library, you get better training data for your neural net. So there's kind of like a synergy between these two modes of learning. And we can compare with a range of baselines. Um, uh, there's more baselines in the paper. Um, I think the one to pay attention to is this kind of brute force baseline, which is just, what if you did lots of enumeration with no learning? Um, and you really do need some kind of learning in order to um, get off the ground for these combinatorial search problems. And the same kind of global picture emerges when you look at lots of different uh, domains. So learning unfolds over between five and 15 iterations. And you really do need both these sleeps, both of these sleep phases in order to uh, get things off the ground. So in these experiments so far, um, we've been looking at a setting where we give it a DSL, a domain specific language, which has primitives that are designed for the domain. So for example, in logo graphics, it has primitives for moving around a pen and doing for loops. But in principle, you could start from something much more basic, something that looks closer to a general programming language. <clears throat> so in the next two experiments, uh, we asked ourselves how far we could push this uh, library learning idea for more basic starting states. So we looked at two case studies, one that starts with a functional language and then learns uh, routines for physics and uh, vector algebra. And the one that tries to start with a very basic form of Lisp and then recover that same functional language. So for physics, what we did is we started with equations from AP physics and MCAT cheat sheets. And we um, simulated random data by running them with random input outputs. Um, and then for each of those uh, simulated data sets, um, we asked the system to write a program which could fit the points um, on that random data. So for example, uh, it has to figure out an equation for Coulomb's law, um, given random values of uh, Q1, Q2, positions R1, R2, and the resulting force. The key twist here is that uh, we did not tell it about vectors. Instead, we told it about lists and arithmetic, and we gave it things like the number pi. Um, and what we were testing is whether it could um, rediscover the kind of basic vector operations, which allow you to compactly express solutions to these physics problems. So if you look in its learned library, in the kind of first layer of functions that it learns, you see uh, simple vector operations, things like scaling vectors or computing vector norms. And then as you look deeper into his library, what you see are things that build on top of that in order to do things like integrate second derivatives over time. So it starts to look a little bit less like vectors and a little bit more like physics. And if you look into its final layer, what you see are things like uh, templates for inverse square laws. So for example, once it has this library, uh, it can find solutions to these problems. And what's important is that the solutions are very compact and very easy to understand and, and interpret. So for Coulomb's law, it calls out to its inverse square law schema, and it also calls out to its subtract vectors routine. So I think that this very compact way of expressing a solution is very close to how I would think of Coulomb's law as operating. Um, and if you were to rewrite it into these basic list processing operations, um, things which don't know about vectors, then suddenly it no longer looks like Coulomb's law. So again, not only is search being made more tractable, but it's also the case that the solutions become more interpretable. So in the next experiment, we looked at those recursive 
list manipulating routines. And we tried to see if they were um, learnable, um, starting from something more basic, here just the Y Combinator. So it can write functions which start with the Y Combinator and then recurse. So we gave it a problem set of, um, I think, around 20 um, recursive programming um, tasks, like those shown on the right. And one of the first things that it did is it defined these two subroutines called fold and unfold. So fold is a higher order function. It uh, also sometimes called reduce, like in map reduce, and it recursively consumes a list. Unfold is a slightly less common function, um, but in some sense, it's like the dual form of fold. It is a function which recursively produces a list. And each of these functions are definable in terms of the Y Combinator. Now, what's important is that um, once you have fold and unfold, um, these two routines actually span the space of possible recursive functions over lists. So in theory, you could use the Y Combinator, but you could also use fold and unfold. So once the system defined these two functions, it then proceeded to never use the Y Combinator again. So it decided that it, that it was much more compressive to use fold and unfold. So for example, it defined map in the fold family, or if you know range from like Python, then range belongs to the unfold family. Um, and then routines that bring together the fold and unfold families like index. So this style of programming where um, instead of using explicit recursion, you use fold and unfold is sometimes called origami programming. Um, it's a cute name and uh, I, uh, Jeremy Gibbons did not actually invent it, but he has a really nice tutorial on this style. Um, so you can follow the citation if you want to learn more about origami coding. Um, and it's nice to see that it kind of retraced this origami style. But the main point here is that by um, learning these symbolic abstractions, the system is not stuck with the symbols that it starts with. So because it can define new symbols, if you give it the wrong symbol, so if you give it like the Y combinator, it can do a kind of symbolic change of, change of basis and decide that it's actually much more effective for search to use a different symbolic basis. Now, in this experiment, because we were starting from a very um, minimal starting state, uh, we required a lot of compute, uh, in particular about a year of compute. But um, one thing about the system is that we have ways of parallelizing the search over programs and combining that with neural guidance. Um, so in particular, you know, we didn't actually have to wait an entire year to finish this test case. Um, uh, it completes after about five days, as long as you have a machine with 64 CPUs. So the things that you should take from this is that there's a kind of synergistic interaction between uh, neural program synthesis and also learning a library. As we get a better library, the dreams become richer and become a more valuable source of training data. That causes the neural network to become better at searching for programs. So we solve more tasks and then we can learn a better library. So there's a kind of bootstrapping or synergy between these. Now there's lots of caveats. So in particular, the search is still um, a, uh, it's, it's neurally guided, but it's still, uh, basically an enumerative search. One lesson here is that, um, you know, the knowledge representation of this system is basically completely symbolic. Uh, there's a neural net for guiding search, but everything else is symbolic. Despite that, um, one thing we find in these experiments is that symbolic representations are not necessarily interpretable. For example, a machine code representation of a program is not very interpretable. But if you are growing your library and extending your language, then it becomes better for search and also better for interpretability. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about some ongoing work on creating programming problems. So this is something that all of us do when we're learning how to program and that we keep on doing as researchers. We're always making up new problems. So how can we capture some elements of that creative process when systems are learning how to program. So could we make a synthesizer that learns by making really interesting programming problems? So many reasons why you would do this. 
One is you could train self-play algorithms on this. Um, you could use this for tutoring systems or creative assistance. So imagine like um, a system which comes up with interesting graphics programs and helps graphic designers by showing them interesting designs. So that's the motivation. So the premise that I'm gonna work with is that interesting problems have short solutions, but it's hard to intuit that solution at a glance. So for example, boilerplate does not have a short solution. So boilerplate is boring. Uh, printing the squares from one to N, that's a short program, but if you see the output, it's easy to intuit how to solve the problem. In contrast, math riddles or fractals or things like that, according to this metric, these are very interesting. So in order to cash this out, we need some way of modeling program shortness and also the ease of intuiting um, the answer to a programming problem. So in DreamCoder, we're learning a library which acts as a prior. Um, so we can just say that the description length under that prior is program length. Difficulty to intuit can be modeled by this neural network, the recognition model, which is predicting problem solutions conditioned on problem statements. So we can compute description length both under the prior and also under the recognition model. And together, those two things act as proxies for length of um, solution as well as difficulty of intuiting that solution. So you can think of it as there's kind of like a Pareto frontier. Um, and we're trying to optimize two objectives. One is how simple are we? And the other is how hard is it to recognize the solution? And different programs are gonna live at different points on this Pareto frontier. And our job is to kind of pick the points on the Pareto frontier. And those we conjecture are gonna be the most interesting. We have some sort of preliminary, preliminary results here that suggest that there might be something to these objective functions. So if you look at things on the Pareto frontier, um, you do actually see that they look like interesting designs. So on the towers domain, one of the most interesting things that it picks out is this kind of uh, cathedral-like architecture. And nothing like this cathedral was ever in the training data or ever in any of the randomly generated dreams. So for instance, if you look at the training programs, it looks like this. Random dreams, which you saw earlier, look like this. But the interesting programs are much more diverse. Um, so for example, you see things like the cathedral or like this snake-like design. Um, now that's not generically true. Like some of the stuff that is picked out by this objective function actually look, in my opinion, quite boring. Um, but it's definitely giving some kind of valuable signal. So I think that this multi-objective criteria might be necessary, but it's really not sufficient in order to get this off the ground. So this is very much ongoing work. So the kind of takeaways you should have from all this is that program synthesis is a challenge for AI, but also um, my position is that synthesis could be a technology that helps us build AI systems for jointly learning and reasoning. And the idea is that source code can act as a kind of interpretable, generalizable knowledge representation. We can do this through uh, methods that are inspired by the activities that humans engage in as they write code. So that means things like learning libraries, um, interacting and executing your code in a REPL, and also um, making up your own programming problems. This could be either random problems like in DreamCoder or in um, ongoing work where we're trying to do this in a more intelligent manner, um, which could help either the kind of self-play you see in DreamCoder or could be useful for uh, more human-facing tasks like um, tutoring assistance or creative assistance. So that's it. And I'd be very happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much.